Hi everybody, I am back for John Dewey. This is chapter seven, um, the progressive organization of subject matter. And in this chapter, he is really just talking about how to avoid making experiential education uh, chaotic. Um, he says you can't just kind of throw your learners out there into the world and expect them to really learn. Your experience has to uh, have some substance to it. Um, as I was reading this chapter, I couldn't help but think of another scholar called Burton Sisko. He talks about setting the climate for effective teaching and learning in a lot of his literature, um, specifically the three relationships. And so my kind of final Dewey reflection is going to be based on how John Dewey approaches those three relationships that Sisko talks about. So John Dewey's ideas came much before, long before Sisko. Um, Sisko was writing, I think, in the 1980s. Um, John Dewey, Experience in Education, was written in 1938. Um, so Burton um, really didn't tie in Dewey to um, this piece of literature that I was reading. Um, however, I kind of just saw some similarities in how John Dewey approached the three relationships that Sisko mentions. His three relationships are um, the student's relationships to other people in the class, um, your student's relationship to the instructor, instructor, and also the relationship between your student and the content. And so if you can kind of see where I'm going with this, I'm going to kind of relate what John Dewey is saying to each of those three relationships and to kind of uh, work on how I, as an instructor, can kind of further my understanding of those relationships and how they affect your real um, an individual's learning experience. And so in chapter seven, Progressive Organization of Subject Matter, um, he begins by kind of mentioning that objective conditions related to experience um, enhance or hinder your real learning. And those objective condition conditions are observation, your memory, they can be your imagination, and even wisdom from others. Um, in the old education, the subject matter is, if you think of just the, the core curriculum, you've got arithmetic, science, English literature, history, all your core subjects. And the new education is kind of outside of that thought, and it's working to find ways to bring things that are not ordinary um, into experience for learning. Uh, he provides two kind of warnings or kind of how-tos for instructors. Um, the first one is how do you find material for learning within experience? That is the first step is how to find material. And two is how to, um, how to kind of acknowledge the progressive development of those experiences, experiences and turn them into a richer, more fuller kind of organized form, which to me means um, he is going back to that idea of continuity. How does an instructor make sure that your experience is um, con is conducive to growth? I'm going to do this one, one more time with um, experiential learning. So when I talk about continuity, I like to do this intersection. So your continuity is how to take your problems, uh, how to take the problems that you're solving in this class, um, apply them to a further problem, um, and then your interaction, so experiential learning is um, interaction and continuity, and then your experience is right there in the intersection. Um, I love when John Dewey talks about raising a child. It's just so, it's such an easy metaphor to explain what learning really is, um, and it just makes the most sense. So I get why he's doing that all the time, even though I'm in the adult education field. Um, thinking about that uh, learning as a metaphor for children is just so easy to apply, especially because this chapter was very long. I thought chapter four was the longest. I was wrong. Um, so children, their world starts out really small, and as they learn to observe more and more, uh, they just absorb all this information, and it's called, he calls it their life space. Um, life space and life durations. Um, and then we can get into this whole kind of nature and nurture debate. I kind of have some more to say about that later on, but the starting point of all learning is your existing knowledge. That's the important part. So children take their observations and they they, they do know things already. Um, I think children are smarter than they might seem. Um, and also, he also kind of warns us how damaging it can be when your first experiences aren't conducive to learning. You can go down a really bad path um, and it can really set you up for failure. So you need to, as an instructor, you should start with experiences that your students already have, and you need to nurture the development of those um, experiences. That's the progressive development plane. Um, so that principle of continuity means that teachers really need to put an equal thought um, into the solution of that educational problem, which is how to organize subject matter and what subject matter is. So equal parts, how to organize it, and then choosing what to teach. 
Um, teachers of kids don't really have a lot of those past experiences to dig through. Um, I like to say that when you're a teacher in maybe a public um, elementary school, a lot of your children, for the, for the most part, will be the same age, they'll live in the same community, um, and you can really rely on this idea of having similar, oh, never the same, um, life experiences. Uh, and I know there's plenty of exceptions to that rule, that is just a big generalization. Um, but when you're a teacher in a public school, you can assume that your kids will be the same age in your group. Um, again, similar kind of community, very different upbringings, of course. Um, but that is just kind of an idea that I like to lean on. Um, adult educators don't have that luxury of kind of guessing who their demographic will be, what experiences you've had. Um, you can have learners with 30, 40, 50 years of different experiences, even more. Um, and then just imagine how different that would be if you're teaching someone with four years of experience. Um, you just don't have as much to kind of dig through and um, dissect, I would say. Um, it's really cool that Dewey kind of recognizes all these differences between adults and children. Um, so he does provide a warning here. You can't assume that progressive development of experience is not just giving them new experiences. You can't just say, here's a new experience and I'm developing you progressively. Um, that's not how it works. Um, it has to relate intellectually and it needs to have the potential, the potential to pose new problems. That's the continuity plane. Um, educators must be trained for the long look ahead. I like this. So a doctor um, kind of his, his work is done or his he assumes his work is done when he kind of restores a patient to health. That's not always the case because it's the patient's responsibility to kind of take the doctor's advice and work towards a better future. The doctor is just there to assist them. Um, and just like just like this analogy, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. Um, an instructor can lead you to the subject matter, but you cannot make your student drink. Um, the educator needs to see your work in terms of what it accomplishes for the future. I really like that idea. Um, I have a page of notes that are <laughs> running out of note space here. Um, in traditional schools, your perceived future need um, comes from external resources. It's, your, it's the people that are designing the curriculum. And we got to decide on what learners kind of may need to know for the future, but it's just guesswork, really. Um, and it's based on wisdom and judgment of those school ad school administrators. So traditional education really says that past experience knows best and they know what to put in the curriculum. Progressive schools don't have that luxury. Um, but should progressive schools really ignore the past? Um, John Dewey kind of says yes and no um, throughout this chapter, which is great. He has plenty of ideas here. Um, and so he is kind of stretching experiential learning from the past to the present and the future. Um, instead of just um, past and present in traditional schools, he kind of looks ahead more, which is kind of a cool analogy. Um, whew. So with our, this is a really long chapter, um, he kind of brings up social institutions as well with kind of this idea of past, present and future. Social institutions and our customs and our morals and our values didn't just come overnight. They didn't just show up in, in our culture. There's a long history behind them. Um, and we need to we need to recognize that in experiential education, just like that. You can't just throw an experience at someone and have them learn overnight. It really takes time to kind of digest your experience and reflect on it. And we cannot solve society's problems overnight as well. It takes time to observe present problems, learn from the past, and then really try to work to solve them in the future. Going into a problem without the full picture is more damaging. Um, if you have half the information, you're only gonna solve half the problem or not even gonna solve half the problem. Um, he brings up two extremes here, which I really liked. Um, so number one, education should transmit cultural heritage only, that is it, or education should focus on the present and future. Which um, kind of which kind of end of the spectrum do I land on? I'm not sure yet. Um, I'm still kind of working on that with my final reflection on Dewey. Uh, but not all pro progressive schools will land in the same spot. So there's different kind of places for each progressive school to land. Should you be transmitting your information from the past or do you learn on your present and future? Um, obviously, I, I don't know. I'm going to end up somewhere in the middle. I just don't know where. Not all progressive schools will land in the same spot. That is really, really important. I just wanted to reiterate that as well. Um, however, this is kind of where he goes into that kind of talking about the 
experiences being less chaotic. So you can't just um, pick subject matter and place it into your experience, otherwise it's going to turn into a chaotic experience. Um, and here is where he kind of talks about, again, what I said at the beginning of my introduction about a child being raised in a chaotic home. Um, they're just more likely to kind of come out of that experience with kind of emotional and mental problems. Um, and again, we have a lot of exceptions to that rule. There's some brilliant people that came from broken homes that I know personally. And I also, um, you know, there's celebrities that have stories of, you know, there's rags to riches stories. That's definitely the exception. Um, but that's not always the case. And not a, not a lot of kids are that lucky. Um, and it's, we can get into that whole kind of nature and nurture debate again, which I won't go into. Um, but that's just a good analogy as well. And I just, again, I love how John Dewey takes the uh, metaphors of children as a, a learning experience. I hope you can kind of see how chaotic your life could kind of turn out to be if you are educated poorly. Um, so subject matter and um, unforeseen, so unforeseen circumstances, I think are really important. How does progressive education kind of prepare for the unknown um, in regards to subject matter? Um, so those unforeseen circumstances need to be used to the advantage of the learner. The instructor needs to be trained how to use unforeseen kind of life experiences that the individuals have to their advantage. And remember that problems for learners are stimulating. So instructors need to use scientific knowledge that he talks about, you know, the past experience. He needs to use that to help prepare the students and you can't just ignore it. So John Dewey himself is kind of landing in the middle of that spectrum of education should transmit nothing but cultural heritage versus needs to pre prepare, it needs to use the present and look to the future. Um, on page 81, he says, this was really hard for me to kind of um, figure out what he was saying here, but page 81, he says, we are told almost daily and from many sources that it is impossible for human beings to direct their common life intelligently. And so to pick this apart, um, I'll, I'll reiterate. So page 81, he says, we are told almost daily and from many sources that is, it is impossible for human beings to direct their common life intelligently. So I got two things from that. Dewey is saying that one, humans are emotional and two, humans are complex. Um, so he kind of brings up that relationship between international relations and domestic relations. Um, and he says that large scale social planning is impossible. Um, and I, I agree. So basically what he's saying here, when he says we're told almost daily from many sources that it is impossible for human beings to direct their common life intelligently, he is saying that no one size fits all. And he kind of reiterates that on page 88. Um, he kind of confirms that you need to be really good at adapting your material for like a four-year-old versus an 18-year-old. Um, when you're an adult educator, your kind of, your uh demographic of students is much, much wider. So you've got maybe an 18 year old or you've got a 65 year old. Um, and it's, it's just great to remember that no one size fits all. Um, he then kind of goes into saying that intelligent method, which is that kind of progressive organization of subject matter, your intelligent method should be supreme. Um, and intelligent method, like I said, it's that progressive organization of subject matter, but it really is critical thinking. Intelligent method is critical thinking. It's problem solving techniques. And that's what he's talking about um, when it, in regards to directing common life intelligently. So there's no one size fits all when it comes to problem solving techniques. Um, on page 84, um, he does kind of expand on this idea of continuity and growth. So again, I'll do my interaction continuity plane. Um, he says that growth and judgment is your ability to form purpose and to arrange your means for realization. So he's also saying here, how can you apply what you learned to a new problem? Um, he follows that, and I'm gonna end um, my kind of chapter summary with this. On page 85, he kind of provides a warning to instructors that unless um, your problem of intellectual organization can be, intellectual organization, that's the progressive organization of subject matter, can be worked out, uh, your students may re react poorly um, to your externally imposed methods. Externally imposed here is just that curriculum, again. Um, you don't want your students to drift aimlessly in their experience, and that's all he's really saying in this chapter. Um, he's, gi he's giving us plenty of ideas to make sure that doesn't happen. 
Um, and I will, I'm going to end that chapter right there. So just remember, you don't want your students to drift aimlessly. All right. Thanks for listening.